there's a saying that goes, inspiration is everywhere. You just need to look in the right places. And I think by all of you being here today, that's what you're showing, that it's not about the quantity of people that are here, it's about the quality of people. I see organizations such as Cognizant, I see OLX, I see SECO, I see X Accenture, I see IBM, and of course a lot of very successful entrepreneurs that are here in the room as well. So your network doesn't necessarily have to be only from the industry that you're part of. Your most exciting opportunities, your most exciting partnerships will probably come from people that you never thought of, you of interacting with. And why we invited Tarun here today is because, like Vilya said, he's truly somebody that all of us should aspire to look up to or should aspire to become like, because he's lived a very exciting life by choice. Uh, born in Bombay, grew up in Pune, did his engineering from our very own PICT. He lived in Barbados in Jamaica in the UK. Then he moved to the US to start working with G. He worked with G for a couple of years and then he said, you know what, life isn't exciting enough, I want to start my own startup. And he started his own startup in the 90s, ECQ, and at that point of time managed to raise $54 million in VC market, which I think by any standards is not a small amount. The other exciting part was, because of the dot-com bust, the startup unfortunately had to be shut down. But Tarun resurrected himself, reinvented himself, and became chief officer, chief customer officer for Asia Pacific, as well as CEO for BMC Software India. He led the company to hit in the top 10 of great places to work in India as well. And he's also written two best-selling books. He's also a philanthropist. He's recently become an angel investor as well. So without further ado, a round of applause for Tarun. And please welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So thank you, Divya. Thank you, Sadat, for uh, having me here. Um, I think I'm going to be talking. The topic that uh, I'm going to talk about are five things that keep up CEOs at night. And uh, what is it that they most worry about? So when you typically look at a CEO, uh, obviously they are talking about business because you need to be able to make sure that you've got enough funding and finance to be able to run the operation. But there are many other things. And, and I'm going to pick the top five. Some of it is going to sound cliche because they are the obvious ones. But some of these are things that most CEOs do not talk about, but are extremely important. And I think that they need to talk about them and be wary of them a little bit more. And as your entrepreneurs, you get a chance to set the culture up front. Because it is very diff difficult to change cultures later on. As the companies become bigger, it is very difficult to drive cultural transformation. And so since many of you are entrepreneurs or work for big companies, it's very important to be aware of them. So number one on that list, of course, is financial prudence. It's business basics. And that means thinking about profitability, thinking about revenues, and thinking about how is the money being spent. And this one is very important because first thing you need to understand it is what is it that you're in the business to do? So there are so many times I see Twitter debates that how can this company that has lost money for its entire existence, why does it have a market capitalization of a few billion dollars? You know, uh, we've seen a lot of unicorns in India. They're losing money like crazy. So doesn't that then go against the principles that you're in business to do to have revenues? And I think that that is true. But the goal determines what your financial goals are. When you are a Paytm or an OLX or an Ola, you're not in it only for the, rev for the revenues and the profits. You're in it for market grab. So if you're trying to establish yourself as a brand leader, and what does that mean? That means that if I'm going to book a cab, there can be a hundred cab services, which is the first one that comes to mind. Human beings are creatures of habit. So when you're the number one, maybe the number two, you have a shot at getting that as a customer. If you're number three, and Jack Welch was the guy who made it famous that you have to be number one or number two in the industry, otherwise we're going to shut the business down. And the reason is people don't go to number three. If you guys shop today, where do you shop from if you're shopping online? It's either Amazon or it's Flipkart. When was the last time you bought something from a Mintra or any one of those, Snapdeal, when, you know, very rarely do you end up going to those sites. And even if you go to those sites to do some cost comparisons, eventually the transaction happens on, this, on, the, on an Amazon or maybe a Flipkart, right? When you're trying to book a cab, what's the first thing that comes to mind? 
either an Uber or an Ola. Do you know the name of the third taxi company in Pune? You don't. And so when you're in that market grab, it is then okay to lose money because you're in the investment mode. And when you're in the investment mode, you know that the revenues are for the future. So when Facebook bought WhatsApp out, I think a lot of people question that what, why did they buy? Why did they spend $18 billion or whatever for the small little company? And if you start to look at it just from one perspective, when they introduced the voice service using WhatsApp calls, with just 400 million subscribers, they were bigger than AT&T or any large telco company. So a lot of this, now today also they don't charge you for WhatsApp calls, but if you're on the network, all of us are on the network, it's simply a switch of the dial. If they said, okay, now you start paying me only $1 a month for uh, using my service. That's $400 million in revenue on day one. So when they, can, when they choose to switch the revenue uh, button on, at that point in time, the money starts to come in. Now when you choose to do it, you don't need to ever do it if you can afford it. Amazon has never been profitable or has been profitable in pockets, but it doesn't really matter because their goal was very clear. Now, if you're not in that goal, if you're not in the goal in the race to be number one or number two, then you have to be very careful about making sure that you have business basics. That is, there is profitability in the operation because profitability is what will allow you to grow. And so I think it's very, you need to as entrepreneurs be very clear which boat you're on which of these two sides and then your financial model needs to be built on that. The second is that you always have some, if you're an entrepreneur, maybe you're the owner of the company, you're the majority shareholder, but it is also possible that you've gotten diluted to a point that you're no longer really in charge. You raise so much money from venture capital that now you want 10% of the stake in the company or whatever and somebody else is calling the shots. At that point, as a CEO, you need to become very strong to be able to make sure you have enough money because if you got greedy investors, who are trying to maximize profit and take a lot of the dividends out and you don't have enough money to run the operation, then also you run the risk of running the operation to the ground. And so as CEOs, that responsibility becomes yours. And so financial prudence is the one that I put on top because without money, you don't have a business, you don't have anything else to worry about. You don't have to worry about products, customers, nothing. So number one responsibility is money. Number two is ethics and integrity. The reason companies go out of business is because there is a fraud. And as the CEO of the company, you're personally accountable to ensure that there is no fraud. So I'm, most times people will talk about customers being first, but in my priority, I think customers fall at the end, last. Ethics and integrity compromises will cost you your job, the business, and maybe also jail time. And so this is something that I'll, I don't hear a lot of CEOs talk about or should, don't talk about it. And in the, in the global context, I think they do talk about it a lot. In the Indian context, I don't see too many people talk about it. And that is because we may have accepted that in order to get this license, give him some money. If you're a multinational company, you're governed by FCRA uh, and uh, sorry, uh, the Foreign uh, Corruption Act or the UK Bribery Act. And so we're very, very careful. But in Indian organizations, sometimes I find that you're okay to say, hey, you know, it's okay to give a little bit of money. I think we have to be very, very careful about those kind of things. And then, do you really pay a lot of attention to the audit reports? Uh, is there fraud? Do you have enough control mechanisms to detect fraud as they happen so that you can take corrective action? If you're the CEO or you're on the board of directors, you're personally liable. And so that is the second thing that I know I lost sleep over. If you got a few thousand people for you, it is impossible to know what every single individual is doing. But any single individual's act holds the CEO directly responsible for it and accountable for it. So you have to spend enough money in putting controls in place. And more importantly, talk about things like the whistleblower policy and recognize the whistleblowers and take corrective action. Even though most companies will have a whistleblower policy and they will have anonymous reporting of issues, very often if you don't act on it, people b lose faith uh, in that policy or in, uh, your, in the management's team to be able to react to it. So I think you know, I would put ethics and integrity compromises on the second list. The third one is really employee safety and security.
And this is not simply to say, do we have the best people working for you? But it is really two different things. One is the safety of the employees physically. Uh, and this includes, if you're in a manufacturing company, making sure there are no accidents that uh, uh, hamper people's lives. But it also means other things, and especially with women in the workforce, the ability to have open conversations about things like rape and molestation. These things happen, but may not get reported. And uh, if people don't believe that the management team is going to take serious action, the law requires you to have a posh policy, prevention of sexual harassment. But it's not in the law, it's in the spirit of the operation. And so it's got to be, it's got to be uh, non-reactive or proactive to make sure that you're talking about these. I know that even uh, I'm having this conversation here, people don't use words like rape and molestation in large groups. But I want, at least at BMC, we used to talk a lot about it, saying that these things, if they're happening or you feel that somebody is abusing or abusive, you need to report those kind of things to it. So one is the safety of the employees, and the second is the security of uh, people. They're two separate things. One is also emotional security. Productive people need to feel secure. And I think it is directly tied to the culture. I'll tell you a couple of stories about how culture is influenced by the vocabulary in use and the behaviors of the leaders. This story goes back to when I was at ECQ. It was a small company. Uh, at peak, we were about 250 people. But in a startup's younger days, you tend to work long hours. And we used to work long. I remember I used to go into the office sometimes at 6 AM. And I hadn't gone home for 72 hours straight because there was so much work that needed to get done that we used to be in the office all the time. At least me and my founders used to be. And me and my founders started to kid around. So we used to see people come in, and then when they're leaving at 6, 6.30, we used to say, what, having a half day today? And it was supposed to be a joke. But what we didn't realize is that it became a huge thing because people would stay in the office all the time. They would not go home. And my co-founder used to take a lot of pride in it. And he used to tell me, look at the amazing company culture we have created. People are so passionate about the work, they just refuse to go home. And initially, I believed that. And then I started to have doubts about it. And I said, I don't think that's why they are not going home. They're not going home because of this comment that we make. And he said, I don't believe you. I said, we put it to the test. And so he and I decided that one day at 6 o'clock in the evening, we walked to the office and we told everybody we're going home. And we went out for a cup of coffee. And when we came back half an hour later, the office was empty. And he said, no, no, people have just gone for a cup of coffee. They'll be back. And we waited, and no one came back. The next day, I walked around the office issuing a personal apology to all the employees, saying it was meant to be a joke. Please come in when you need to. Please leave when you need to. And, uh, and then people still hesitated till they realized that the apology was sincere. And so you have to be very careful as leaders about things that you say because it can take the culture for a toss. Similarly, when uh, I took on BMC software, I realized the vocabulary that we use creates a culture. So a uh, simple example, when I took on, a lot of the good engineers wanted to all be managers. And we would ask them, why do you want to be managers? And so now, well, manage, uh, in management, we have a better career choice. And then I realized that that wasn't the case. The thing is that when we did performance appraisals, we used to look at things called span of control. Span of control is how many people report into you. Uh, and because of that term span of control, people started to attach themselves to control, saying that the bigger the span of control, the more important I must be. And as an individual contributor, you don't have a span of control. And so they felt that we were rewarding the managers. And the more people that reported into them, the more uh, important your role was. And hence, there was career progression. We started to change all that vocabulary. And we moved away from span of control to span of influence. As an individual, you can have a lot of influence on people, but you don't need to have control on them. Anyway, organizations run not by command and control. In the army, you need that command and control. But in the knowledge industry that many of us are part of, it is really about active debate and conversations, and maybe arrival to a decision by consensus, though consensus is not always required. But the more you have talked to people and the more you communicate about why a certain decision is made, the more likely people are to go along. And so security, employees feeling secure in their work, has a lot to do with the mindset and the culture that you're trying to set as, organize, as organizational leaders. 
So I thought that was a very important lesson that I learned. Uh, it's not just physical security, it's emotional security and stability. And I'll also tell you that uh, a company doing well does not have nothing to do with how the employees feel. So as an example, I remember as, at ECQ, we were not able to meet payroll one month. We were raising funds, the funds had not come in and we had run out of money. And so a lot of people were saying that let's just not talk to the employees uh, about the fact that we have no money. They'll freak out and they'll leave. But it wasn't the case because we called a meeting with all our employees and we told them that we've run out of money. The money will come in shortly, but we don't have any money anymore. And the employees turned around and said, you know what, we will bring our personal laptops and computers from home and we'll continue working. If you don't have laptops or you've got to return the laptops, we'll bring in our own computers and we'll continue to work. So effective communication, not trying to sugarcoat everything, because a lot of people don't give enough uh, importance to the ability of employees to understand and be empathetic towards what the company is facing. Most people are always willing to help. So setting that tone, I thought, was a very important part of it. And again, you know, it's insecurity, because if you can't meet payroll, then I think a lot of people would feel insecure and start looking for a job. But opening up the conversation with them, I found has been a very different, uh, plays a very different role. The fourth thing in uh, all of this is the product quality and service. Uh, when you build software products, or hardware products, or you're building an auto component. What most of people don't realize is that a quality issue can result in serious disgrace for the company. And sometimes it is not to your company only, it is also to the companies that you're providing uh, components to. So if a car catches fire, it's most likely the battery that is at fault. Now if the battery manufacturer just said, look, I just make batteries, and you have quality issues there, it's still the other company that's going to face issue. Obviously, you run the risk of going bankrupt, then nobody's going to buy your batteries if uh, they are flawed. Same thing in software. If you build software that has not been tested, one is customers run their operation on it, and they can have far-reaching effects. Sometimes they can be life-threatening. They can get hacked into. But if you've not built safety checks and security checks into the platform, then there will always be people who will try to abuse it or try to uh, use the platform or software for personal gains. And as we move into a digital world, there is nothing that is not digital anymore. You can be manufacturing something, but within ne the next 10 years, it's all going to be software. With Industry 4.0 coming in, IoT is coming in. I'm sure many, uh, some of you are from manufacturing, right? At least I met somebody. Yeah. When you start to look at how all of that is being done, software is driving almost everything. And you have to be very careful about, no matter how small your component is, you have to be very careful about quality. So for me, that is one of the things that gives me uh, sleepless nights. About whether, it's not about the fact. You also don't know that most customers, sometimes they put their job on the line to get your software, to buy your software. Somebody has made a decision based on a business outcome. They've put your trust in it and if because of a quality issue their company goes bankrupt or their company is subjected to a hack or uh, their cars are catching fire or their samsung tablets are catching fire and you're not allowed to take them on the flights anymore it's not samsung samsung doesn't make batteries somebody else does right? but it's always the company that is collecting and assembling and integrating all of the that have a brand reputation risk if you know that samsung's catch fire would you buy one one by one. And so it has a very direct impact on the company's top line, bottom line, and the reputational risk is severe if you have quality issues. So the fourth thing that I tend to think about is quality. And then the last thing is customer value. I think a lot of people talk about customer intimacy, customer care, all of that. But it is not customer care. When a customer buys your product, he's put his faith into your product. And especially when you're in larger businesses, like uh, BMC is an enterprise software company, a transaction could be a million dollars easy. Some customers would spend $50 million a year with us. When you look at software service companies or Infosys, the question is that did they derive the value from what it is that they thought they were buying? Did they get that? 
So since there were five, there are many more that we could talk about. But since I was talking about the top five, these were the top five that came to my mind. I thought I should spend some time talking about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.